How about that? Is that any better? Yeah. Brilliant. It's great when you uh, get started at these things and you, you have to fiddle about to get the technology working. So I think everything's working now, so that's fine. Um, <laughs> for Christ's sake. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually just kidding. Uh, so, uh, it's just a slide. It's quite hard to get these slides, actually, because when, when you get this sort of thing, it's hard to take a screenshot. Um, we're quite used to this, aren't we? Software just not working the way, the way it's supposed to. And um, when this happens to you, this probably happens to you, or something of this form happens semi-regularly, and you just kind of curse and reboot your machine. Um, the point, of, the point of my research, what I'm aiming to do, is make it so that, that you know, just the fact that software fails should be a thing of the past. It's kind of embarrassing that, that, that you write a program, and not only does it not do what you're supposed to do, it doesn't, it doesn't even do that. It doesn't even get that far, because it's crashed. Now, we can just reboot our laptops, but if you have one of these, does anyone have one of these? Nobody has one of these anymore. Do you recognize it, anybody? Um, if you've been to one of my talks before, you might recognize it. Um, this is the Mars Climate Orbiter which um, NASA sent this to Mars in 1999. The intention was that it would communicate with um, the Mars Polar Lander, relaying back uh, climate information back to Earth. What it actually did was crash straight into Mars, um, which is why this is an artist's impression rather than a photograph. Um, the reason it crashed into Mars, you'll see I've given the heading type error. Um, there was some code that was working in imperial units and some code that was working in metric units, and they didn't, this, this, this didn't get on. Um, and, and obviously NASA have not made this mistake again. They're, they're, they, they, they think about this, this kind of problem in advance. Um, but there's all kinds of other things that can go wrong in your software that's, that's beyond just confusion between imperial units and metric units. There's all kinds of, of, of precision that you might want to make about your code um, uh, that, that is very hard to express, or not, not even necessarily possible to express in, in the kind of mainstream languages we use today. Something a bit closer to home you might recognize, remember this? So this is, uh, this is a security error that was uh, so painful it even got its own t-shirts and logos and marketing departments got involved and all sorts. Uh, so this is Heartbleed. Um, so um, really, we should know in advance that this kind of error, I would hope that we can make this kind of error just, just not possible. If a program type checks, you should know that at least, uh, at least it's going to run to completion and it's at least going to perform within the various parameters that, uh, that you've, uh, you've given it uh, up front. So, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about my, uh, my attempt to make this the way we program in the future. I'm not going to, I'm just, just to manage expectations a little bit. I'm not expecting you to uh, take what I'm, uh, you know, to listen to what I'm saying, take what I'm saying, and then, and then use it in your day job tomorrow. This is, this is well, maybe some of you will, but it's, uh, I'm not going to expect this to take over the world, you know, within the week. But I do want it to, um, uh, I don't want you to go away thinking about, okay, maybe there is another way. Maybe there is a better way to approach software development. Uh, and maybe, if nothing else, to get you thinking about uh, the types that you give your programs up front. Maybe to get you, just, just get you thinking in advance about what kind of uh, performance characteristics, resource usage characteristics uh, your program is going to have. You can um, download and install it. Um, you can even do it during the talk if the wireless is working, I suppose. Um, so go to idrislang.org download. And you'll notice I've called it a Pac-Man complete functional programming language. I used to call it things like a you know, general purpose language or a, 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 system, a language for systems programming, but nobody could really seem to agree on uh, um, on, on what those phrases meant. I hope we can all agree uh, on what Pac-Man complete means, because I'm going to tell you what it means. Um, it means there is enough in this language to give you the capabilities of implementing a Pac-Man game if you want to. Now, in practice, that means you're going to need to uh, interface with the system. You're going to need to run reasonably quickly. Uh, you're going to be able to do, have to do graphics libraries. You're going to have to do um, responses to input, uh, and so on. Um, so it's, uh, I think, more interesting than Turing complete in, in practical terms. So some, some chuckling there. Um, I mean, Turing complete, a Turing complete language or a Turing complete system, you can use it to solve any kind of computable problem. But a lot of surprising things are Turing complete. For example, uh, the C++ template language is Turing complete. Um, but um, you're not going to go and implement Pac-Man in the C++ template language. 
listening out for someone saying challenge accepted, because I've, <laughs> I've, I've occasionally been in the kinds of rooms where people do that. Um, white space is Turing complete, but not Pac-Man complete. So, so I'm just saying that this is a language in which you can do your day-to-day -day programming if you, if you really want to. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, though, is not, the, not, not so much some big examples. I just want to give you a flavor of the, the development process and the kind of problems we can solve, the kinds of properties that we can express. It's going to be in two parts. Um, the first sort of 25 minutes or so, um, I'll just give you a brief tour of programming in Idris, showing the, uh, the methodology. And the, the title of this talk was Type Driven Development in Idris. And this is about uh, TDD. Uh, um, I'll call it Type DD, just to disambiguate. But, uh, uh, so it's, uh, the title is Type Driven Development, so we're going to put types first and use the types to help us get towards the correct program. And I'll show you some, some pretty small examples, but the kind of examples that you will do as the sort of fundamentals of building larger programs. And then, then in the second half, I'll show some slightly larger examples. I mean, again, fairly small, just to, just to give you a flavor of what's going on. But some, some bigger examples of how we might use this in reality and to interact with the outside world. So managing programs with side effects, managing programs that interact with you know, external resources like you know, uh, um, network state, robots, whatever, nuclear missiles, whatever you, whatever you happen to be working with. So what are type systems for? Um, now, I, I guess I should, I should have asked this earlier, um, just to get a, a feel for the, the kind of audience this is. Um, who, would, who would say that, just by show of hands, who would say they understand functional programming? But I say understand functional programming. Oh, that's quite a few. I was going to, um, not most of you, in fact. But I understand, I simply mean you can look at a simple Haskell program, just pick Haskell as an example, Haskell ML program uh, that maybe reverses a list. You could look at it and think, yeah, I can see what, what that's doing. So just, just to clarify. Yeah, more hands going up. Good. <laughs> so I don't, I don't mean that you can, you, can uh, you know, take... Haskell, OCaml, whatever, and be sure that you're going to be able to write a program. Because I just want to make sure that you can, you can actually read the examples I'm going to show you. And you know what I'm talking about when I talk about uh, type systems and type checking. Uh, so uh, many of you in your day jobs might program with statically typed languages. Many of you may program with dynamically typed languages. All languages that you will use these days have type checking and type systems. They'll differ in uh, when they check types, whether, uh, whether that's... Um, before uh, you run the pro before you compile the program, while you run the program, uh, in Idris's case, it's more about while you're writing the program. Um, and the, the 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 purpose of type systems, people often think, is to uh, quite reasonably that they are for checking that a program has the intended properties. So so knowing in advance that the program is going to do what you what you think it's going to do, and what happens, you know, you write your program in <coughs> Java, Scala, Haskell, whatever your favourite type language is. Uh, you feed it to the compiler, and uh, pretty much every time the compiler says no, you know, see me after class, you've done it wrong. Um, it's like you're feeding, you're, you're handing over your 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 uh, your latest work to to the priest who who will bless it or not, or who will you know give you a mark out of ten, probably zero. Um, but that's not the way we should see compilers. We should see compilers, or we should see type checkers as being like um, like a lab assistant, where you say. You say to your assistant up front, or your, you know, your, your apprentice in the, uh, in, in the, in, in the workshop, it's like you give the, the, the program up front, or you give the type up front, so this is what we're going to work on. And then you and the compiler together should be, uh, should be you know, working towards a complete final program. So you sort of see this in action when you're programming with, with a more uh, mainstream language like you know, Java. In the, if you add, a, if you add a, an argument to a method, you could manually go through the entire program uh, and find all the places where you call that method and, uh, and, and add the argument, or you could ask the compiler to do it for you. And there's various refactoring tools and even just compile errors that help you do that. So you, you do see a little bit of this. Um, but the more powerful your type system, the more you can express in your types, the more you can get the machine to, to help you out here. So the second thing type systems are good for is guiding a programmer towards a correct program that the programmer intended. Finally, I'm not going to do much of this today, but you'll see a bit of it. Uh, the more expressive your type system, the more expressive and generic your libraries can be. Now, application developers probably don't want to think, I mean, and, and this depends on the application developer, of course, but they probably don't want to think in too much depth about all the complicated trickery you're doing with your types in, in libraries. They just want to use it and get the applications running. So as library developers, what, uh, what we might like to do is 
is make those libraries as generic and usable and as expressive as possible to make the application developer's job much easier. So the stronger your type system, the better chance you have of doing that. So in type-driven development, we're putting types first, much like, uh, so the, the name type-driven development is, is, is deliberately uh, similar to test-driven development because many of the ideas are remarkably similar. So in test-driven development, you put the tests first and you use the tests to help you decide what the program is supposed to do, help you work through the, you know, the various edge cases, help you make sure that the program keeps running after refactoring and so on, all of these things that, that, that putting tests first is good for. Type-driven development puts types first. And everything we do is going to have, uh, every, every action we do is going to come under one of three headings, um, type, define, refine. It's, it's sort of our analog to red, green, refactor, but not quite. Uh, so we, we might write down a type for a function or look at the type of a sub-expression. Uh, then we might define a program. And notice I said programs are possibly incomplete because the vast majority of the time, the programs you write are incomplete. In fact, almost 100% of the time, programs you write are incomplete. I think it's really useful if a compiler or if a language implementation can help you work with incomplete programs and, and tell you bits about your incomplete programs to help you make progress. So defining a program might be making a possibly incomplete implementation. And then the refine step, the final step, of, well, possibly final step, is to um, improve or, or complete that implementation. So... Um, Take the implementation you've got, possibly in incomplete implementation you've got, and take it further. So, uh, I think I'll just get on with some coding. Um, so, that's pretty much it for the slides. And I want to actually show you what I'm talking about. So, uh, firstly, am, am I okay for font size here? Yeah, nodding at the back. So, uh, just by law, I have to show you Hello World. Um, so, uh, we have modules, we have a type declaration. Every function has a type declaration. Remember we say uh, types come first, so every function has to have a type declaration. This particular type declaration says main is uh, an I.O. action. Um, Idris is a pure functional programming language, which, which means that uh, functions can only, um, that they are just expressions. This expression is an expression that describes what the program will do when it's run. So an I.O. action is a description of the I.O. actions that happen when the, the runtime system gets hold of the program. And just to give an idea of, of, the, of, of how we do compile and run these programs, um, you can load this at a, a read eval print loop. So there's a, an interactive prompt. Um, I can type colon exec. And it will compile and run the program, or I could, uh, I could compile it to some executable. Great. So that's all, that's all the conventional stuff out of the way. That's the last program we'll see running for a little while. Don't worry, we're not going to go crazy here. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to start by just showing you what a dependent type even is, or what, what, a, what, a, what a, a language with rich types, you know, precise types, is what I even mean by that. So, when you first learn about functional programming, what a lot of people like to say is that uh, in a functional programming language, uh, functions are a first-class construct of that language. That is to say that functions can be passed around like any other value. You can, you can create, so functions can be arguments to functions, they can be returned by functions, and so on. Just ordinary values, just like anything, any other thing that you might pass around. Uh, in Idris, using type-driven development, types are a first-class construct. So this is, in some ways, this is like the essence of what's going on here is that types are things that can be computed by functions, they can be so returned by functions, passed to functions, and so on. Once you can do that, it means that you can, um, you can calculate the types of uh, some parts of a function based on some other inputs to the function. Now, uh, again, show of hands, who's done some C programming? Uh, not as many as I thought, actually, but quite a lot of you. Um, if you've done C programming, you've encountered this idea, and it's in C, it's printf. You've, if you've seen printf, if you've used printf in C, and if you haven't done any C programming, you've probably heard of printf. The idea of printf is you've got a format string, and then you've got some other stuff. And that other stuff, the types of that other stuff, and the, the amount of that other stuff, depends on what the format string was. And this tends to be hard-coded into the C compiler, because C, surprise, surprise, doesn't have a dependent type system does have this, this one case where compilers will look at printf and, 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 and report helpful errors if you get the format string wrong. But if you have that ability to, to compute types from values, then you should be able to write functions like printf just in the language and, and, and have, have, have the, the standard compiler check them for you. 
I'm going to show you a much simpler example first, just to give you, get you a feel for the notation. So um, this function here, somewhat contrived function, is a function that takes a Boolean as an input. So this notation, um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is to the left of the arrow uh, is an input to the function. To the right of the arrow is the output for the function. So this is the function's type. This says what the function is going to do. It's going to take a Boolean as an input. And I just happen to have called that Boolean is string. Uh, I'll pronounce that is string. And it'll return, uh, and this function will return a type. So that's the type step of type define refine. We've decided what the function is going to do. Next step is define. So I'm using uh, the atom text editor here. The atom text editor has uh, a mode for interacting with an Idris process that, that, that allows you to, remember I was talking about using the machine as your lab assistant. So I'm going to use atom as my lab assistant here. And I'm going to say, please add me a definition for uh, string or nat. And what it does is it provides uh, a skeleton definition. So definitions in Idris, like, um, like other pure functional languages, are a series of recursive equations, or possibly recursive equations. So you can think of them as like rewrite rules. If, if, if the runtime sees this on the left-hand side, it will rewrite it to that thing on the right-hand side. It's just like when you're back at school doing algebraic, you know, simplifying algebraic expressions, that kind of thing. You probably don't want to think back doing that at school, but that's pretty much what's going on. The compiler's doing it for you. Um, so this thing here on the right-hand side, this is called a hole. Uh, the question mark in front of it indicates that, that we don't know what this is yet, but we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out later. And when you have a hole, you can ask the machine what the type of that hole is. So it will say what variables you have available and what you need to return. So if I hit uh, Control-Alt-T here, it says down the bottom. Can you all see the bottom? Or should I, should I, uh, the way you're craning your neck suggests that I should move this up a bit. Um, how about that? Any better? Good. So this, uh, this bottom window here, this is a, an interaction window. Uh, and, it, and you'll see that we have something called is string available, and it's got to return something of type net. Another thing I can do um, is, is with the cursor over this variable here, I can say to the machine, what possible values can that variable have? And it will give me the different possible cases um, that, we, that, we need to be, uh, that we want to be working with. So if I do um, control C, C for case split, it will give me the two possible cases for, for a Boolean. So um, what I'm going to do is in the first place, the hint that the, the variable name is string suggests that if this Boolean is true, the type is string. And if it's false, it'll be uh, something else. So, so if it's, oh, that's the other way around. You see, types only help you if you write the type down properly. Um, it, well, in the same way, tests only, you know, tests only help you if you write the tests properly. Similarly, types only help you if you write the types properly. They're, they're, not, they're not there to read your mind, obviously. Um, OK, so this, this function takes a Boolean and returns a type. So what on earth would you do with such a thing? Well, what are the places where you can use types? The places you can use types are in function definitions, function declarations, function definitions. So I have a, a function down here. It's called uh, length or add one. You can see this is somewhat contrived. Uh, it takes um, a Boolean as an input, and then the next input, the type of that next input is going to be different depending on what the value of the first input is. And I'm going to use this string or nat function that we've just defined to calculate it. So I'll do the same thing, add a definition. Um, so um, there we are, add a definition. Um, Check the type. Always a good idea when you've got a new hole to check the type of the hole, see what you have available. So it says here, we have something called is string of type bool, and we have something called x of type string or nat is string. So there's, there's not an awful lot we can do at this stage to, to continue defining this function. We have these, we have these two values, um, but we certainly can't do with anything with x, because we don't actually know, we don't actually know what the type of x is yet. The only way we're going to know what the type of x is is if we know what the value of this string is. Yeah? Some nodding. Good. So if I do a case split on is string, we get these two cases again, false and true. And now if I check the types of the right-hand side. So remember, x has type string or that is string. And we know in this first case, is string has type false. So if we check the type of length or add one, it now says, OK, I know that in this case, x is false. So let's continue evaluating. I have the information I need. So I now know what type x is. So I can decide well, length or add one. In this case, the intention is to, you can tell from the name. Sometimes you just need to look at the name. Uh, I'm going to add one to x. And then in this case, um, I'm going to get the length of x. 
So, um, just to all the time I'm um, all the time I'm doing these definitions in Atom. By the way, every 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 step it's being type checked by uh, the system behind the scenes. If there's a problem, it will report it as we go. So, um, what I uh, you know as a educator, uh, I attempt to teach. And uh, one thing I like to say to students is, is don't write 50 lines of code and then feed it to the compiler. Feed it to the compiler all the time, always, constantly. Because the sooner you, you know, if you find an error immediately after you've typed something, that gives you a very strong indication of where the error is likely to be. Not necessarily always true, but it gives you a good idea where the error is likely to be. Gives you less to, um, uh, less you have to think about, L less, less things that might go at once. Uh, so this atom mode is just constantly, every time you make a change, it's, 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 um, uh, uh, it's, it's type checking the code for you. So um, if I load it into Idris, I shouldn't get any errors, really. Um, so I can try running that function, or we can, we can try type checking that function, just to, just to really hammer home what's going on here. Because everything I do from now on, you know, this, this, this may look like a, a very small abstract example, but everything, like literally everything I do from now on is going to depend on the concept that, uh, that you've seen in this example. You know, if, if I check the type of length or add one of true, um, it says, okay, we need, we need a function from, uh, that's a function from string to nat, so if I give it a string, uh, it will calculate the length of the string. And if I give it a, a nat, um, we'll get uh, a compile time error. Um, it's a bad choice, bad choice to use NAT because we have to disambiguate between all the numeric types. Let's just give it a definite NAT. It says, okay, type mismatch between NAT and string. So there you go. Uh, so I mentioned printf just to show you the same thing works. Down the bottom here, I've, um, I've got the, the, the type of printf. Printf takes a, a, a format string as an input and it returns the type it calculates will be calculated from that format string. So um, just to prove that that's what's going on, I'll give a uh, format string. So if I, if I check the type of printf percent s percent d, that should, with any luck, and I'm slightly worried because I was hacking the compiler on the plane over here and I didn't test this specific example. So what could possibly go wrong? Um, oh, thank goodness for that. Uh, so percent s percent d, it's a function that takes a string and an int and it returns us back uh, a string. So, so there you go. Um, if I give it a string and, a, and, a, and an int, it will give us a formatted string and int. Right, so that's, that is, that is the, the essence of type-driven development, is give the types up front, values of things can determine types of other things, and we use the machine to help us get to the, uh, uh, the, the final program that we want to run. I won't show you the process of printf, because I've got far more interesting things to show, and only 25 minutes to do it. <laughs> so. Let me show you um, vectors. So vectors are, um, better make that a bit bigger. Um, <clears throat> now when you're working with um, list types in your favorite programming language, you might write functions where, where you make assumptions about lengths of the list. Like, like you might make an assumption that a list is not empty. Or you might make an assumption that if you have two lists, those lists are the same length because whatever source you've got the list from, they always provide you things of the same length. So if you're a good citizen, you will write in a comment above the function, assumption, lists are the same length. And then six months later, when someone has changed the source of those lists, they're not the same length anymore, uh, but your comment still type checks, funnily enough, <laughs> and your program no longer works. So when you have more precision in the types, when you, have, when you have the ability to calculate types of things from values of other things, you can actually state those assumptions precisely in the type, and your comments will be type-checked, sort of. Um, so what, what I have here is a definition of, of lists with length. So th this might look a little scary at, at first. I'll walk you through what this definition means, and, and then we'll see some examples with it. So the idea is a list will carry in its type some information about the length of that list. So here we're defining vectors which are, um, that they, they have, so you can read this as, as a, a function which computes a type, kind of. So vect is a function which computes a type taking the length of the vector's input, so we always, we always call lists with length vectors, it's just a, a, thing, a thing we do, a bit of notation to get, a bit of terminology to get used to. Um, so they take a length, they take um, the element type that's being carried by the vector, and that gives us back a type. 
So nil, that's the empty vector, has zero things in it. So when, when you see a nat, nat is defined in terms of these two symbols, z standing for zero, and then s applied to some argument which stands for one plus something. So it's kind of structural. Uh, so s of s of s of z is standing for three. Um, don't worry about the details of that. Just, 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 just let that wash over you. Go with it. There's a good reason for it, but uh, um, just, just let, it, let it wash over you for now. We'll see what happens. Um, so, and this double colon, I pronounce this cons um, because I learned Lisp in the 90s. Um, and and it, 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 it takes a, an element, uh, um, so a value of the element type. It takes a vector with k things in it, and it gives us back a vector with k plus 1 things in it. So this s, you can read this s as 1 plus. So that means whenever we construct one of these vectors, it's going to construct alongside just, it's, it's not possible to stop this. It's going to construct alongside the, the length of that vector in the type, which means if we define a function on vectors, we're going to have to write in the type what lengths we expect um, those vectors to have. So if we're appending two vectors, I've got a vector of some element type of length n, a vector of some element type of length m, and that gives us back a vector of n plus m things. So let's just do this definition. I'll show you what happens um, using this type, define, refine process. Remember, we uh, first thing we did was make a skeleton definition. So we'll make a skeleton definition. And it says, uh, oh, um, this, this uh, declaration here, percent name, when the machine generates skeleton definitions, um, it will, if there's no other information available, it will generate reasonable looking names for you from this declaration. So, so um, I like to call vectors things like X's and Y's, and so I pronounce that you know, X's as in X plural. Um, so if, if, the, if the vectors are truly generic, you don't know anything more about them, that tends to be, I think that's a reasonable name. Um, so if we look at the type of the whole, we'll see that we have, um, I don't want atoms sluggish today, but um, so we <laughs> We, um, we have um, a vector of m things. We have a vector of m things. Notice also we have m and n. So m and n are actually real, the real arguments to this function. They're things, that, they're things that we can inspect if we need to. But we also have x's and y's of, of, of these particular lengths. And we have, it's going to come back with, uh, we've got to come back with a vector of n plus m things. Good way to write this is by looking at x's. So if we, if we inspect x's and it turns out that x's is the empty vector, then the answer is going to be just y's. In fact, I'll just show you that. Well, I'll hit, um, I'll hit case split on x's, and it's going to give us the two possible cases for the two possible definitions for append. It says, okay, you're going to have to work out what to do to append y's to the empty vector, and then you're going to have to work out what to do to append y's to the vector consisting of x cons x's. So if I look at the type of this append right hand side now, it says, right, you've got you've got a vector of M, th uh, M LM types, and we need a vector of M LM types, so this result should be easy. And in fact, it's so easy that the machine should be able to work this out for us. So what I'm going to do over this hole is I'm going to hit Control-Alt-S for search, and it will say, yes, I know the answer. So as, as search problems go, the, the, the artificial intelligence crowd are, are not exactly worrying about this. Um, however, it's, it is, actually, we should take their expertise. I think we can, I think we can get a lot here. Uh, the amusing thing, actually, is if you look at the second case, let's, let's just quickly look at the types here. Um, so we've got y has m things, x has k things. We need a vector of 1 plus k plus m things. So that means we need everything from here. We need everything from here and one more thing. And we happen to have one more thing. It's called x. So we need to work out how to get a vector of k plus m things from a vector of k things and a vector of m things. And when you're defining a recursive function, uh, you're allowed to assume that that function works, at least for smaller inputs than you've currently got. So we're actually allowed to assume that we can append x's and y's, and we'll get a result. So the way to define this function is uh, x on the front, and then recursively append x's and y's. And with any luck, the machine was listening to me and, and understood that, and it did. Brilliant. So, uh, <clears throat> well, there's only one reasonable definition given what we've got. So let's just ask the machine. It's much easier. I've done all this work in putting information in the type. So why should I do the work of writing the program as well? That's, that's just boring. 
So, um, I have a few other examples like this. I won't go through, um, just for time, I'll, I'll move on to the more interesting one. Um, if, uh, if your boss came along and said, okay, oh, this is the kind of thing you see in exam papers, you know, your boss comes along and tells you to take a, a, a nested list of lists and transpose the elements of those lists, who would enjoy doing that with linked lists in, I don't know, Java? Yeah. That, that, when I was, whenever I ask questions like who would enjoy it, there's normally somebody puts their hand up, but I don't know, maybe it was the in Java that did it. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this program that, that takes um, nested, a vector of vectors, so a matrix. I mean, this is, we're starting to get a bit more realistic now uh, because if, if, if you happen to be a mathematician and you're working with, uh, with matrices, uh, the kinds of errors that you're going to make when you write the programs are probably to do with you know, imprecision in off-by-one errors in length of the matrix and so on. So uh, what I'm going to do is write down, or what I've already done, is write down a, a precise type for uh, an n by n matrix and then write down the type of transposing that matrix. So, so if I've got an n by n matrix, uh, transposing it will come back with an n by n matrix. And uh, uh, well, we'll just, we'll just follow the steps that, that, that we've been doing so far and, and see if the types help us get to, um, uh, get to an answer. Um, right, so as usual, we'll, we'll make a skeleton definition. We've got, we've got a, an input vector. There's pretty much only one thing we can do here, which is look at the possible cases for that vector. It's going to be either empty or non-empty. Um, so in the case of the empty vector, let's look at the type of what we have to do if we have an empty vector. Uh, and it says, we need to make m copies of the empty vector. And I can't be bothered to do that now. So the machine's not quite clever enough to figure this one out. But it can at least, I can rename this whole and say, I'll come back to this definition. We'll make a new definition. We'll call it create empties. And there you go. So it's, it's created a new top level function called create empties. And we'll fill that, we'll fill that in later on. We'll move on to the more interesting case. So in this more interesting case, we have, um, so we've got x, which is a vector of m things. We've got x's, which is a k by m vector. We're trying to transpose the whole thing. And remember, we're allowed to assume that you can make a recursive call on the smaller thing. So we can, we can certainly start by turning this k by m vector into an m by k vector just by transposing recursively. So I will do that. Um, So this, this notation just means um, do evaluate this sub-expression and bind it to this variable. So, um, and uh, we'll look at the type of what we've got just to confirm it's what we expect. And um, OK, so the transposed version of x is, is an m by k vector. That's good. And again, well, let's, let's think about what we have to do here. Um, is there anything I can write on? There isn't anything I can write on, is there? Um, Never mind. It's, uh, uh, this, if you, if you, um, I, I, no, I can, I can, I can do this in a comment. Actually, uh, who needs, who needs pen and paper when you've got a text editor? Um, so imagine you've got a vector of this form. Make it, yeah, okay. So what we've done is we've, we've split off the top bit of the vector. We've transposed this remaining bit. I hope, <laughs> I hope it makes sense what I'm doing there. And the, the game is to rotate these three things so that they're on the front of this vector that we've transposed, yeah? I showed this to someone in a pub once, and they said, ooh, like a Rubik's Cube. I said, yeah, kind of. And then they said, can you write a program that solves the Rubik's Cube? No, not now, <laughs> later. We were in a pub, this sort of thing happens. Um, uh, right, so uh, again, I'm going to say, Let's, let's do this somewhere else. Let's, 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 let's make a new definition. And uh, just to speed things, I've, why is Atom so sluggish today? I think I'll report that as a bug. <laughs> um, so um, because I happen to know, because I've done this before, I'm not going to need x's. I'm just going to remove this argument. Um, and uh, so this, this helper definition is, is doing exactly that rotation. It's got, a, it's got a, a, a vector of stuff. I need to get the, those three things from the top onto the front, so turning them around. And, and if I look at the types of everything, um, so we've got m elements. Then we've got m 
vectors of k elements, and I need to make m vectors of successor of k elements. So basically, cor the corresponding elements, if, if we look closely at the types, the corresponding elements of x and x's, I basically have to take each thing from x and put it onto the corresponding thing in x's trans. And for the sake of speed, I'm not even going to think about that. I'm going to do, uh, let's see, case split, uh, case split, search, case split. Notice, by the way, when I'm doing these case splits, it's only giving me one option. And that's because the two vectors are the same length. And if I have one vector that has the form x cons x's and another vector that has the same length, and I do the case split, it's not going to give me the empty case because it, it's just not going to type check. Anyway, uh, search. Good, it type checks, ship it. Um, I'll do the same thing for create empties. I need access to M. Um, and I'll just do case split search and uh, type checks, ship it. Uh, I just happened to have made a main program because I knew I was going to do this. Yes, I did prepare in advance. Um, so um, I'll, I'll load it into, it'll, it'll complain that there's a couple of de definitions I haven't uh, um, made yet. But if I, it, this, what this does is, is it asks for uh, the size of the vector, it will invent a vector and then it will transpose it. So a five by three vector, it's, it's made a, uh, a five by three vector and it's turned it into a three by five vector. I guess you can confirm that that really is a transposed vector. And I just did that by looking at the types. Um, and, and asking the machine to help out because that was much easier than actually thinking about how a, how a vector transposition... I mean, we do have to understand how vector transposition works. This, this case split and search really isn't a substitute for knowing what the program is supposed to do. But once you've looked at the types, that gives you a hint as to how that program is going to have to proceed. It's, it's made us think about... You know, so that thing I sort of drew in the text editor with the dimensions and the rotation it makes us think about that. Um, so before I move on to states, just one thing. We can do compilation at the command line. Uh, it's, it's some, sometimes you want to do batch compilation. And to show how this might work, um, uh, we can actually, what I could do. So Idris has, um, yeah, Idris has a, a way of plugging in back end. So if you want to be generating JavaScript, say, um, you could write uh, something that takes the inter Idris intermediate form and generates JavaScript. or um, Let's say, uh, if you happen to be writing a WordPress plugin, as I'm sure you practically all are, you have to write that in PHP. Uh, well, you don't have to write it in PHP. You could write it in a language that compiles to PHP. So why don't we... Um, <laughs> so I don't know if any of you ever fancy writing a linked list transposition program in, in PHP. I don't, but, but my compiler can do it for me. And just to prove it, it's doing the right thing. There we are. That's it. <laughs> A link list. Uh, and I guess we should have a look at the results just to show that it really is PHP. And this is this is what it generates. And it's this is kind of like enterprise ready. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, good. Um, moving on. Uh, right. So that's the basics. And. Uh, now you're all going to go and write WordPress plugins in Idris, I hope. Um, I did that as a bet. I, just, I, just to be you know, clear, I didn't spend much time on that. Uh, which is both reassuring for you and, and pleasing for me. Because that's only about 130 lines of Haskell code to do that. Uh, that I mean, it, 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 it's incomplete in that there's, there's primitives that it doesn't have. But that's just a matter of adding the primitives. So if you really do want to you know, generate, say, Java code, uh, and you have you know, a bit of time and a little bit of Haskell expertise, then you can do that. Anyway, none of this is getting us to Mars without crashing into it. So let's look, uh, let's look a little... Oh, sorry, I should have a, a, a commercial break. I forgot I'd put this in. If you're interested in this stuff, uh, you, can, you can buy this. It's, it's not finished yet. There's only three chapters to go, though. And um, anyway, move on. Come back to that. <laughs> so yes, if, if, if we want to get our uh, uh, machines to Mars, or if we want to write our security protocols that don't break, we're going to have to think about uh, state transitions, state machines, and how to, uh, how to write uh, state transitions correctly. So it says here I have about 10 minutes, yeah? So yeah, uh, that's, that's enough. Uh, so here's the simplest state machine I could think of to demonstrate how this works. It's the, the state machine that describes opening and closing doors. So um, 
we can be in one of two states, closed or open, and if we're in the closed state, uh, so these, these, these are the actions we're allowed to do, we're allowed to knock on a closed door and we're allowed to open a closed door. And if we open that closed uh, door, we had better end in the open state. Now notice in an open door, you're not allowed to knock on an open door. Um, you can only close it and that will get you back into the closed state. Um, there is a realistic analog to this, which is, which is file handles. But uh, file handles have all kinds of other complications. And come to think of it, so do doors if you start thinking about it too much. Um, <clears throat> but it's just to illustrate the idea of, of, of uh, protocols and defining an API that can, can work through that uh, protocol. So yeah, enough of that. Let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to the code. Uh, which window are we in? We are in this window. So. Um, <clears throat> what we have uh, in, um, in Idris is a library that allows you to describe effectful programs, and those effectful programs can have some... When, when, you, when you execute an action in an effectful program, that program can have some influence um, on the underlying state. So this is, this is one of the simplest possible effectful programs, just to show you what the structure is like. So it's a, F means it's effectful. This value here is the type it's returning. And then this thing in brackets is the list of... Uh, effects or the list of uh, it, it, like um, the capabilities that that program has. So this program has the, the console I/O capability. So the door example in this door example, I can encode. Um, I'll do this. I'll do it from here. Yeah. So the lines to focus on are. If I'll just make them clear. Put them at the top. Um, are open door, closed door, and knock. So these, um, this 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 F type, it takes not only or potentially not only the uh, the capabilities that the program has on input, but it also says what the capabilities of the program are going to be after it's run. So it's kind of like a state machine, kind of like state transitions in the type. So this uh, open door program, on input, it, it can only be run if we have the door capability parameterized by the fact that the door is closed. And when it's finished, it will have the door capability parameterized by the fact that the door is open. Close is the other way around, and then knock, it says we can only, we can only knock on a closed door. And then down the bottom here, I better uh, shift this up again. Ooh. My mouse is getting fiddly. I need a new computer, clearly. Um, <clears throat> any old excuse. Um, and we have a program here that works through that, that, that door usage protocol. Uh, this doesn't compile, or well, it does compile, but it doesn't run because I haven't, I haven't actually implemented a door opening closing mechanism. We'd have to sort of attach it to a, you know, some, some, some handler for these effects. But I can give you an idea of how it, um, uh, uh, at least of how it type checks and, and, and what happens when we, uh, when we type check it. Ooh, what happens is it says, you haven't told me about effects. Let's tell it about effects. Okay, so that type check's fine. But if I do something like, like let, let's say I uh, forget to open the door before I close it. Um, it says, well, it says it went wrong, but if we look more closely at the it went wrong, who, who reads big error messages that just says it went wrong? I mean, that's how I read them. If we look closely, it says type mismatch between open and closed. So we're trying to do something with, um, uh, with a closed door, and we need it to have an open door. Or maybe we'll try knocking on an open door. Uh, and again, we'll get a, oh, I get a slightly more useful error message here. It says, I, uh, I, I'm trying to find a, a closed door, but I've only got an open door. So what we've done is we've encoded that state machine in the types, and the compiler has ensured that we followed that state machine, that, that state transition system correctly. Um, high profile example of, uh, of where this sort of thing didn't happen in real code. Do you remember go to fail? So there's a state machine going on there. There is a state transition that, that was not the intended one because there were two go-to fails in a row that weren't bracketed. Um, so I mean, I'm not going to claim that if they'd only implemented OpenSSL in Idris, this, this error wouldn't have happened. But I'm going to say this is the kind of thing that it would be lovely if you could express this kind of thing in the type system and know before someone exploits this weakness for two years that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that it's going to do the right thing. Now, there's still a problem. Uh, sometimes at this stage, there's someone leaping up and down and saying, but hang on, what happens if? What happens if, like, at, at the minute, we, we're in control of the state transitions here. We have said that the door has opened, but what if the door needs a bit of WD-40 and the robot arm can't shift it? The door's still closed. The door's jammed. So sometimes the outside world is in control of, of, um, 
of, of the state transition. So we need to be able to express that kind of thing in practice. So I have a slightly refined version of it here, um, it's, uh, where opening the door, instead of just saying, right, the door is definitely open, it returns whether the door jammed. And the input state is still the door is closed, but the output state is, if the door jammed, then it's still closed. If it didn't jam, then the door is open. We've seen something exactly like this right at the beginning of the talk. When I, when I showed you a uh, string or NAT, inspecting the Boolean and seeing what happened, this is exactly the same idea. It's something in the type that says how the states move on depending on the result of an operation. Uh, so what I'm going to do is write a program that works uh, through this door protocol. Um, and uh, I, can, I can stick meta variables in, 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 in these effectful programs too. It's very useful to be able to say, I want to do more with this program. And I could look at the type of it, and it will tell me, hopefully, something useful. So it says, oh, notice that I've also given it console I.O. So I've said that this thing can work with doors, and it can do console I.O. at the same time. So it's, it's a program that starts with a door in a closed state, and it needs to get to a door in a closed state. So the first thing I'm going to do is open the door, and I need to check the jam status of the door. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open the door and record whether or not it was jammed. Uh, check the types again, see what we have. So jam has type jam. And now we have to, now this is a little bit more tricky. So now we have to get from a state where there's a door and, oh, it's in some state. It's in some state which depends on jam. Um, so this, this could be a little bit tidier. We're not quite version one yet. Um, so it's a case block. It depends on jam. So remember before when we had this function that, that could calculate a time, uh, type based on the Boolean input. Well, this is a function that can calculate a type based on what jam is. So let's just have a look and see if it helps us. So I'll make a case block. Uh, let's put it in brackets for some reason. Let's take them out. Um, I'm going to check what jam was. And um, I'll do a case split on that. And in the two cases, if the door was jammed, then the state we're in is the door is closed. And if the door didn't jam, then the state we're in is that the door is open. So in this case, this is the uh, most important or the, the, the kind of sort of privileged case, we'll close the door. And then in this case, we'll print an error message that implies some kind of struggle. And um, I don't know, we'll try again. <coughs> So, right, that type checks now. We've, we've, we've happily gone through that protocol. Just one thing, because um, I'm very short of time. Um, this sort of thing, if you, you want to open lots of doors in a row, this sort of notation gets a little bit ugly and very deeply nested. We don't want to have exceptions, because with exceptions, you don't know what state you were in when the exception was thrown. And we're trying to reason about the state of these things. So what I did was I looked at uh, the programming languages, that, some programming languages that might help me, and I, I decided that the most inspiring, most useful programming language that would help me most in this situation was Perl. <laughs> Barely a snicker, amazing. <laughs> um, so um, what we're allowed to do is, is, is have a... Um, uh, sorry, that should be the other way around. We're, we're allowed to write down what the privileged case is. So the, the, the privileged case of this is opening the door... Um, and you know the, the idiom in Perl where you say open file or die if you know Perl. So we can, we can write the uh, error case off to the uh, other side. And, and then we can, uh, normally I type check more often than this, but uh, then we can have as many of these things as we like and we don't get that horrible deeply nesting of, of, of things. Um, so very briefly in my last one minute, minus one minute, uh, I want to show you a slightly bigger example of, of, this, of this same idea, is, is more interesting protocols. I mean, this, this, is, this, is, this kind of state transition machine where we ask the system to tell us what state we're in uh, comes up all the time if you're developing any kind of interactive stateful system. I thought a rather fun example was uh, the, hang, the, the game Hangman. So you have a number of guesses. You're trying to guess letters in a word. You have a number of guesses left. You have a number of letters still to guess. So those guesses and letters are enough to describe the rules of the game. So I've defined a data type here that says, you know, we've, we have a running game with these two you know, guesses left, uh, letters left, 
And then further down, when we define the rules of the game, we can say that uh, a, a, we can guess a letter if we have a running hangman game with more than one guess available, more than one letter still to guess, and then the system is going to come back, tell us whether the guess is right or wrong. Depending whether it's right or wrong, we either lose a letter that we have to guess or we lose a guess that's available. So when you come to implementing this thing, like writing the interactive interface for this game, it's exactly the same as if you didn't specify that in the type. So the program itself, there's, there's, no, there's no real dependent types going on that you can visibly see in this program. You just write the program as you, would, as you would normally. But if you make a mistake, like for example, this really happened when I was writing this, instead of looking at the uh, number of um, uh, guesses left to see if I'd lost, I looked at the number of, um, the number of, of, of letters still, uh, yeah, the number of letters still to guess, was, uh, if, to see if I'd lost, which is the wrong way around. I think I said that the right way. And I got a type error, which was pleasing, uh, and, it, and it surprised me. And another type error I got was um, it didn't occur to me that when I read the list of words that the strings I was reading might be empty strings. And I got a type error again because the machine said, hang on, you haven't said what happens if the word that's given into this uh, has, uh, has zero letters in. And that's the sort of thing that, that comes up and surprises you um, when, when you run the program, because you, you know, just didn't, it, maybe your source of letters, words changes, and, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, suddenly your list has an empty string in it, and then it goes wrong, and you get a seg fault. Okay, so I don't really have time to go to that in any depth at all. I just have time to finish off. Um, just, just to summarize, why we care about dependent types is safety. We know that the program is going to do the right thing before we run it. We've got this idea of encoding resource usage protocols, and we know that we're going to follow the protocol as we've written down in the types because the program type checked. We've got some expressivity, so we can, we can write more descriptive APIs. Wouldn't it be lovely if you were writing socket programs in C if the API actually told you what that file handle actually meant? So we can do that. We can write that sort of thing in, a, in, in, the, in the API and be sure that we're not going to call um, a function that we're not in the right state to call. Um, and eventually, we're not quite here yet. I claim that um, if we have precise enough types. That means the machine knows more about the program statically. So the machine should be able to optimize really quite aggressively. There's a few examples we've tried of this, just partially you know, specializing programs based on some inputs. And I think you know, this, is, this is a longer term project. I think it's not out of the question that we can write device drivers, operating systems, embedded systems in this functional style just because we have enough information in the type to tell the machine you know, when it's supposed to allocate, when it needs, or what, what kinds of things it needs to specialize. Uh, so I hope that's at least uh, vaguely inspiring, and you'll keep an eye on this to see what happens next. Uh, so it's not ready for production use quite yet. The only thing that's going to make it ready for production use, to be honest, is brave people coming along and having a go. And I'm here to help if you do. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'll just leave that up as a shameless, uh, as a shameless way to finish. Thank you very much. if we have time for questions or if I should do it over coffee. Yeah? I, I'm afraid I haven't done Pac-Man. I have done Space Invaders, and my claim is that Space Invaders complete implies Pac-Man complete. I think there's a hierarchy. <laughs> uh, so if, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, uh, if you, it's, it's, it's too boring. I'm an academic. I, I, I do ideas. I don't do implementations. <laughs> I, I hope that's demonstrably false. I do do implementations, but uh, <laughs> yes. The code generation you showed us yes. looks like you're maybe not halfway to a full blown theory prover, but maybe halfway to Isabel or something like that. Yeah, um, there's a lot of similarities with theorem provers. Uh, in some sense, Idris is a theorem prover. Uh, that's not something I normally say up front because it scares people, but absolutely, yes. Uh, you, you, you can try to prove theorems in Idris. It's, it's geared towards programming, though. It's, it, the, the aim is that you write programs, and every so often if you're writing um, a program with a really precise type, you will find you need to prove theorems. They tend to be easy theorems. They tend to be sufficiently easy that they're automatable. Um, but, uh, yeah, you could. Yeah? Search for results 
Sure. Such as you no know, reversing the entire results. Yeah. So How so do you make sure you get the the right or the uh, I don't. Uh, so so um, that's a very good point. And what I like to remind people is is this program search does not free you from knowing what you're doing. It doesn't free you from knowing how to write the program. You have to look at the thing and think, yes, I did mean that, or no, I didn't mean that. What it does free you from is this really boring step of getting an idea from your brain into the, into the buffer, into the text editor. Um, so th there's a lot to be done there. I, mean, I think there's a whole space of research problems in there. Like, can, can we write some AI that finds much bigger programs? Because these examples I'm showing you are they're basically plumbing. They're, they're, they're fairly small examples. And, and there's, there's this whole space of search for the program, present the user with some alternatives, and say, did you mean this one? Did you mean that one? Um, so what, I mean, the thing I showed you there is, is, is an embarrassingly simple hack. It was like a, you know, just a Sunday afternoon of, you know, let's, let's, let's see what happens if I try all the possible constructors and all the possible recursive calls up to a, up to a maximum search depth. And to my astonishment, it actually worked. Um, and it, the thing is, the only reason it worked is because the types are so precise. There's only so many things it could be. Uh, if you don't give precise enough types, it'll give you nothing. But if you, give, um, if you do give precise enough types, or it'll give you something you know, stupid, or something like really, or something, something very simple. Like if I did that thing for, of a, on a pen for lists, it would just give me the empty list in both cases. Because yeah, type checks. Um, so yeah, it, it certainly doesn't free you from uh, actually thinking about the program you're supposed to be writing, which I think is a good thing. Because you know, types are in some sense a specification. What if your specification is wrong? Similarly with tests. Tests are in some sense the specification of what the program's supposed to do. What is the test wrong? You've still got to do both. OK, I think that's uh... Oh, don't ask me hard questions like that. Not fast enough, but I'm working on it. Uh, it's fast enough to be, to be usable for the kinds of problems we're working on. And when it gets to be not fast enough, uh, we make it fast enough. Uh, this is one of the things I say, I mean, about it's not quite ready for production use yet. If people come along and say, that program took way too long to compile, and, and I need it for X, then I'll say, OK, right, I'm on the case. Uh, so um, like the, the generated code is OK. It, some, sometimes it's competitive with Haskell, say. Sometimes it's two or three times slower. So it's, like, it's OK, but it's, it can certainly be better. Um, OK, I think we're out of time. So thank you very okay, much. OK, thank you.